Michigan for your being here this morning. Thank you for coming uh, to be with us. To those that are visiting, we are delighted that you are in our midst. We hope you enjoy your time in our area if you're vacationing. And certainly we wish you safe travels on to your home and a hearty uh, welcome and an invitation to return whenever you can be with us again. For our regular folks, they might think that I'm a bit of a visitor. It's been a while uh, since I've been able to stand here. Um, I and my family have, of course, uh, dealt with the COVID virus, as so many have. And I know that there are those watching and listening this morning online that continue to deal with the ramifications of that, quarantines and uh, sickness. Uh, some of you have dealt with it, and you're back uh, this morning, too. So I'm happy to see you. But uh, for each act of kindness that was shown to my family and I, uh, during that time and even since, as we continue to recover, we appreciate so very, uh, very much. And uh, please know that uh, we love you. We loved you before, but uh, we love you even more now, if I can say it in that way. But what a delight, a wonderful opportunity to be together with God's people this morning in worship to Him. In 1927, Arthur John Gossip preached in Aberdeen, Scotland, and yes, that was his last name. How would you like to go and have uh, someone say, come here with me, Brother Gossip? And you might say, well, I've heard him before. Uh, but that was his actual name. Arthur John Gossip preached in Aberdeen, Scotland. He was well regarded, uh, the most popular preacher there uh, in that city. He had served as a chaplain in the British Army during World War I and had returned safely and had built a, a wonderful uh, work in that particular city long ago. And he, by his own admission, uh, said that, you know, life could hardly be better. Uh, but then, there's always a then, isn't there? But then, his wife died unexpectedly. And he perhaps would have been justified in taking some time away, stepping back from his ministerial duties, from the classes he would teach and the sermons he would preach, but he decided that would not be the best approach. He thought to handle his grief and sorrow, to process her loss, he would get right back into the pulpit. And so the following Sunday, he began his remarks with these words. These things must come. Yes, unbelievably they come. For years and years... You and I go our sunny ways and live our happy lives, and the rumors of these terrors are blown to us very faintly. As from a world so distant that it seems to have nothing to do with us, and then to us too, it happens. Sudden as a shell screaming out of the night, some one of the great crashing dispensations burst in your life and leaves an emptiness where there had been a home a tumbled ruin of your ordered ways, a heart so sore you wonder how it holds together. And when it does happen, nobody has the right to snivel or whimper as if something unique and inexplicable had befallen him. Never morning, war to evening, but some heart did break. Hearts just as sensitive as yours and mine. But when yours breaks, what then? It is a bit late in the day to be talking about insurance when one's house is ablaze from end to end. The sermon goes on, but that's a good introduction, isn't it? That sermon would be titled and has come down to those who study public speaking and homiletics as one of the most influential in the first half of the 20th century. And its title you see on screen, When Life Tumbles In, What Then? When Life tumbles in, what then? Gossip was right in noting, these things will come. And I'm not talking about the superficial things this morning. I'm not talking about when you drive your new car to Walmart and somebody runs a buggy down the side of it. That's not worth worrying about or fussing over. I'm not talking about when your favorite sports team gives up a lead and loses to a team they should have easily defeated. That's not what we're speaking of. We're not talking about all of the just little things of life that so oftentimes seem to get a reaction far beyond what they deserve. We're talking about the other things. 
and you all have them. If you've not yet, as gossip said, yet not had one of them befall your path, just wait. But probably all of us, at least that have lived any length of time, have had one or more of these incidents. Life has tumbled in. And I could go from person to person, family to family, and ask. And you could tell me of a time, a time that may be many decades in the past, but still the emotion is fresh. We could go to some, and I know some of these are listening and watching this morning, that life has tumbled in just in the last few days. And the emotion and the pain are so raw. And as he said in this introduction, you have a heart so sore, you wonder how it holds together. If that is where you're at this morning, or if you've been there, when life tumbles in, what then? What do you do? One of the times in my life, I won't give you the details, but just to say that life tumbled in, I went and made a renewed study of the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John. And so this morning, and if the Lord wills, the remaining Sunday mornings here in the month of October, I want to take us on an expositional study of this chapter because I believe it answers in a beautiful way when life tumbles in, what then? What can we remember? What can we hold on to? And this is real. This is what we are dealing with. This is what, if nothing else, we can hopefully throw out as a lifeline to our world. Beset by economic distress, COVID restrictions, and the responsibility that we have in that regard, and all of the things that currently are confronting us. For many people, they're asking, my life is tumbling in. Who cares or does anyone care? What can I do? So hopefully this will fortify each of us to know what we can do with the help of God. But more than that, hopefully we can take that help that God offers then and offer it to others also. The first three uh, three verses of John chapter 14 are familiar. Our Savior is speaking, the Son of God. And to His apostles, He declares, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Those words have unfortunately, like Psalm 23 of the Old Testament, sometimes, it seems, have been reserved exclusively for the funeral home or the graveside. And I'm not saying they cannot be used in those settings. Most assuredly, they are comforting then. But before we reach that point, what what do we do? What do we do? Well, this morning we can remember, if you will, and want to title this lesson further or subtitle it, we can remember when life tumbles in the promise of paradise. Now, what do you think of when you hear that word? For some, it's the beach, the palm tree swaying, the crystal blue water. For some people, it might be more of a mountain retreat. It's someplace away from the cares and the troubles and the concerns of life, a place where all seems to be peaceful and idyllic. That's not found at the beach. That's not found on a high mountain lake. It can be found in the words of Jesus. This morning I invite you to consider them with me. In the previous chapter, John adds a sentence that's a bit of an editorial detail, but I think it carries far more weight than just an observation about the conclusion of one day. In fact, in John 13 verse 30, John ends that verse by telling us, And it was not. And it was not. He's probably giving us that clue to indicate that the Passover meal that they had begun to celebrate and the ending of a Jewish day and the beginning of another with twilight and nightfall had occurred. But there's so much more there than that. This is the night of betrayal. In fact, this is the night when Jesus had said in verse 21, Most assuredly, 
one of you will betray me. And he knew who it would be. Peter motions to John, ask, find out. The motive of Peter might have been, let's take that guy out right now. It's a complex scene for sure, and the dynamic at work between Jesus and the apostles here in celebrating this Last Supper, the time when the Lord's Supper had been instituted and the observance of the Jewish Passover had occurred. John does ask, Lord, who is it? A piece of bread is dipped and given to Judas is carry it. Jesus said, what you do, do quickly. But they are, that is, the other apostles, still bewildered. What, what does he mean by that? They thought, well, he's the treasurer. He takes care of the money. Financial responsibility is his, so maybe we overlooked an obligation to give something to the poor at this feast time. Maybe that's what Jesus is dispatching Judas to do. The Bible said, having received the piece of bread, Judas went out immediately, and it was night. Was there ever a darker night in all of human history than this one? Now, interestingly, if you study the timing of the Jewish, uh, Jewish Passover, we know if there had not been cloud cover to obscure it, that it was a full moon. So there would have been more, as it were, illumination from the night sky than usual. But maybe even the, maybe even the clouds obscured the full moon and the stars that night. We're not told, and it doesn't really matter. But what we do notice is that it is a dark night. Because our Lord is going to be betrayed, and He informs them of that. Verse 33, where I'm going, you cannot come, but I leave you the commandment to love one another as I have loved you. Peter is still not satisfied, and combining the other gospel accounts will just show his, uh, you would almost suggest, his stubbornness. Lord, I'll follow you anywhere. I'll go wherever you go. I'll do whatever you do. If you go to prison, you can count me right beside of you. If you die, I'll die right at your side. Lord, everyone else may give up on you. They may quit. They may retreat, run away, but not me. Will you lay down your life, Peter, for my sake? Now, the tone of voice used by both Jesus and Peter is not revealed. Peter, we know, believed with all of his mind and heart, I think, the words he had spoken. Maybe he had been so bold as even to point a finger in the face of Jesus and say, No, not me. You don't know me. You don't know. I'll stick with you. I'm that committed. I'm your guy. I'm your right-hand man. And maybe Jesus said it in response with increased volume in his voice, or maybe he said it very tenderly. Will you lay down your life for my sake? Peter, you really think you will? Maybe he admired his tenacity his confidence, but Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. The other gospel writers will tell us that the rest of the apostles, hearing Peter joined in, he maybe bolsters their resolve, and they said, Yeah, we'll, we'll go and do what Peter said we'll do. Yeah, we'll die with you. We'll go to prison with you. But now Jesus said, No, Peter, you won't. And so in that context, all that we hear and all that we can imagine, what amount of time elapses between the ending of verse 38 and the speaking of the words of verse 1 of chapter 14, we're not told. But maybe they're given just a little bit of time to internalize what Jesus has just said. I'm going away. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be killed. You who have followed me for at least these last three, maybe close to four years. You've seen my power over all of the elements of nature. You've seen me call back from the dead those who have died. But now I'm telling you, I'm going to die. And even though you've been my closest associates, you will be no more. To those trying to reel from such admissions and such news, Jesus says something which may it at first appear almost illogical. But he said, let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. You see, when your heart is troubled, you've got heart trouble, don't you? 
Have you ever had your heart troubled? Now, I know some of you, you have some heart trouble. You may have an irregular heartbeat, afib or an arrhythmia. You may have a blockage. You may have had a stent placed to open up that blockage. You may have even had uh, a radical rerouting of arteries through open heart surgery to restore blood flow. Your physical blood pump needs great care so that you can operate and function as a human being. And that sort of heart trouble is serious, but that's not the type of heart trouble Jesus is addressing. Jesus said, you've got heart trouble, and yes, it hurts both places. And when your heart is troubled, that is real heart trouble. Did Jesus know anything about that? He most certainly did. That word for troubled there involves inward agitation. And I know that people have meant well through the years who maybe have not suffered mental uh, health difficulties. And those who have never really had heart troubles in both places, for them to make pronouncements like, just trust God, just pray more, don't worry about it, your faith is weak. And they'll even sometimes be so brash as to say, it's a sin to worry, Jesus didn't worry. I invite your consideration to three successive chapters in this same gospel in John eleven thirty three, 33, at the tomb of his friend Lazarus, watching his dear sisters Mary and Martha grieve. The Bible says Jesus saw her, Mary, weeping, and the Jews who came with her, that is, other family and friends and members of the community, weeping in sorrow at the death of this beloved one, Lazarus. The Bible says, He, Jesus, groaned in the Spirit and was, there's our word, Troubled. Jesus was troubled. The very next chapter, verse 27, John chapter 12. Now they are in Jerusalem. And Jesus says plainly, My soul is troubled. What shall I say? I've always found that a remarkable admission by the Son of God. We'll keep reading the verse, then we'll return to that question. Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. My soul is troubled, and what shall I say? You may have been asked, what are you worried about? What's troubling you? I don't know. Well, something has to be. What are you worried about? Get over it. You shouldn't feel that way. My soul is troubled. What shall I say? What could I expect? Other than this, the Son of God seems to be implicating. This is the hour, and I've known it. He knew it before creation. And the way that that interplays, that is, His divinity, His God nature with His humanity, I can't begin to say that's a mystery beyond what our limited finite minds can grasp or fully explore the depths of. But in a very, what I might say, human moment, my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? You see, for Jesus, there was the realization, life is, as it were, tumbling in. What then? What then? My soul is troubled. And then, chapter 13, we already noticed this, but you may not have caught it then. Go back and look again at verse 21. When Jesus had said these things, He was troubled. In spirit, I testified and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Folks, if your life is confronted with a situation or circumstance, a tragedy or an accident, when life tumbles in, know this if you know nothing else. Jesus understands how you feel, He knows. And that doesn't make everything in your heart troubled situation go away but I hope at least it provides a little ray of comfort, a small measure of encouragement. Jesus said to these men, Let not your heart be troubled. Is it an imperative? Yes, it is. And the two imperatives that follow are likewise command. Believe in God. Number one, believe also in me. Let not your heart be troubled. But He's not issuing it as a cruel, cold-hearted dictator. He's rather pointing out a problem, I think. A command that is not always easy to obey. Sometimes our experiences blind us to the evidence. It causes us to doubt. 
It fills us with denial and even sometimes the resulting distress of our troubled hearts. When life tumbles in, what then? That, that's the problem. Life does tumble in. What then? Verse 2, remember this proposition. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. A proposition. A proposition when you study logic is just simply a declarative statement that's capable of logical argumentation. That is, you can affirm or deny that proposition. You can prove its validity or if it is invalid, if it is a sound argument or if it is fallacious, if it is to be affirmed or it can be denied. So Jesus gives us a proposition here and He says, you weigh the evidence. In my Father's house are many mansions. Proof? If it were not so, I would have told you. Is Jesus trustworthy or not? He never asks, and contrary to the claims of those who are skeptics or unbelievers today who like to lob these false accusations at God's Son and those of us who try to be His followers, you believe without proof. You just have some fairy tale wish. Read the Gospel of John. These things are written that you may believe. And anytime anyone questioned who He was or what He did or why He did it, He said, consider the works. Give it a fair hearing. Look at the evidence. And then make your own determination. My Father's house or many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. We can affirm that this morning with confidence. Now, things about this verse that encourage me. Jesus said, in my Father's house. That my Father, the God of the universe, the creator of all things. Matthew chapter 6 verse 9, Jesus said, is also our Father. In fact, following His death, His burial and resurrection, before He sends Mary back to spread the good news, He sends her back with this message, Tell them that I've risen. And tell them that I'm going to my Father and your Father. To my God and your God. He's one and the same. And Jesus identifies with us. And there is a Father's house that Jesus knew and it's our Father's house also. For most, that idea of the house of our youth, the home when we were children, is a happy thought. Now, I recognize, and I always want to be very kind and considerate, that there are those who do not have happy memories of childhood, of parents, or other situations that cause them uh, just to have, as it were, that bad taste in their mouth. But your Heavenly Father is loving. Your heavenly Father is described by His Son in Luke chapter 15 when there was a boy who thought he had all and threw it away who went from that penthouse to the pig pen but in the pig pen he said, wait a minute I can go back home. Wait a minute, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And that boy tells us if I'm nothing but a servant in the house of my father that's better than anything that the world offers. If I can just simply be, I don't know what the most menial task will be in heaven if we even have such task. If God wants to give me the lowest of lowest positions in heaven, that'll be better than anything that I can have in hell. In my Father's house. Jesus said there are many mansions. And if like you, uh, or like me and you, maybe when you were younger, and for some that are less mature in the faith, you may hear that this morning and think, he's talking about the mansion on the hill. He's talking about uh, those individuals that we see every once in a while in a movie or television program with a palatial estate and all types of uh, you know, garages for their fancy cars and a pool out back and all of these uh, other amenities. That's not what he's talking about at all. It's not a physical description. In fact, the word mansion here is used again in verse 23 of the chapter, the only two times it's used in the Gospel of John, where Jesus said, If anyone loves me, he'll come or keep my word. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home, our abode with him. Your version may render it in my Father's house are many rooms, many abodes, many dwelling places. There's room for you. 
there's room for me. And that physical description of the spiritual realm, we'll discuss some additional details to that point later on. But Jesus said, my father's house, there's a place. There's a place in my father's house. And this place exists and it's real. And it's this place that I'm going, amazingly, he says, to prepare. Not that it's not yet finished, but that he is going in advance of us. The same word used for the work of John the Baptist. The same word used of Peter and John in preparing that upper room for the Passover meal. They went on ahead. Jesus is saying, I've gone on ahead. What I've went through, you can rest assured, whatever you go through, I've gone on ahead. And I'm on the other side. And I'm waiting for you there and urging you to join me. And so that leads us to the reality that when life tumbles in, there's a promise. Yes, the problem is life does tumble in. Jesus makes a proposition that there is something better. And He backs it up with a promise. When life tumbles in, remember the promise. The promise is from our Savior's lips, If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto Myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Movie buffs will remember Arnold Schwarzenegger saying, I'll be back. But those words were not original to him. The Son of God uttered them first, and they're much more meaningful coming from his lips. I'm going. I'm paving the way. I'm blazing the trail. I'm leaving you a path to follow. And just as sure as I go, I'll come again. And I will, look at this beautiful language, receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. As I mentioned, our concept of paradise or heaven is many times maybe unduly influenced by that rendering in my father's house or many mansions. And so whatever that looks like for you, again, we have different tastes maybe in our own home styles or architectural interest. For some people, they would want a home with an enormous amount of square footage. Some of you ladies may say, that's just more to clean. Just give me a nice, simple dwelling somewhere where I can relax. But again, it's not the physical at all that we're interested in. In Revelation 21 and 22, there is an important word used in verse 11 of chapter 21 as John begins to describe the city, the great city, Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, this language, notice John says, having the glory of God, her light was like, L-I-K-E, a precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And what I'm telling you is what John told you earlier in this same book, That is, that this is figurative language. I'm describing spiritual realities with physical language. This is like. There's no way to describe to the human mind that which is entirely spiritual. Now, I know you like to think about, and many of our hymns even talk about how beautiful heaven must be. We like to think of a gate of pearl, a sea of crystal, uh, these foundations with all of these beautiful precious stones mentioned in chapter 21. We like to mention the street of gold. Uh, Anderson didn't lead it on purpose, but you remember as we were singing together, the hymn just before the lesson was, The Streets of Gold. Brother William Woodson told us long ago at Freed Hardman, he'd get right up to the microphone and say, <clears throat> Boys, there ain't no streets of gold. The Bible just says there's one. Well, whether there's one street of gold or there's a whole interstate system of them, it doesn't matter to me. Not in the least. I don't care. You may say, well, what? you don't care what the Bible says? No, I'm not saying I don't care what the Bible says. I care what Revelation 21 verse 3 and 4 tell me in conjunction with what Jesus tells me in John 14, 3. In John 14, 3, Jesus said, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. So in Revelation 21 verse 3, John says, I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and He, God, will dwell with them. And they shall be His people. God Himself will be with them and be their God. He is unmistakably telling us, what do you know about heaven? 
Street of gold? Maybe. Gates of pearl? Maybe. Sea of crystal? Whatever that is, describing physically the spiritual reality of it, matters, in my analysis, not in the least. What matters is that is the place where God is. That's the place I want to be. God Himself will be with them and be their God. Now, there is consequence to that thought. And the consequence to that thought is what verse 4 tells us about this place. When life tumbles in, remember the promise of paradise. Well, what good is it to think about walking down a street of gold when my heart's broke? What interest do I have in a gate of pearl uh, when an accident or a tragedy has just fallen into my life? I'll admit, I, I don't think those things are very comforting at all. But here's what is. Because God is there, because He will be our God, because we will be with Him, here's the consequence, the ramification of that. Verse 4, Revelation chapter 21. Commit it to memory if you've not already. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Did you hear that word, every? You heard the word tear from your eyes, but God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things. The things that Jesus left us in here that He's leaving behind, that He's going He's going to come and take us out of that to be with Him where He is, where God is. There will be no more of these things. The former things have passed away. What a wonderful promise. When life tumbles in, what then? I know that even these words, certainly these words of mine, are inadequate. But I'm trusting and knowing with certainty from my own experience that the words of Jesus can help. And it is my prayer that they have even assisted you this morning, comforted your heart. More than that, strengthened your resolve and your conviction. This morning, if you came to this place with any doubts whatsoever, and sometimes life is so, quote, good, we'll put that in our little quotation marks, life is so easy, life is so wonderful, I am so blessed, you know, is heaven really that appealing at all to me? And maybe instead of the Lord blessing me on such occasions to have such a thought, it's the evil one, Satan, the devil, my enemy, planting that seed. If he has rooted out of your life. And maybe if you don't, God will bring life tumbling in so that you can refocus. You can reorient. You can go out of this place this morning and you can encounter, and no doubt you will, a co-worker or a neighbor or someone whose heart's broken, and you can shrug your shoulders and say, I don't know what to do to help. And you're right, you don't and I don't, but Jesus does. And so maybe you just simply ask, can I read to you John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3? Does that sound encouraging? Does that sound like something that you would be interested in? And who knows whether your kindness and compassion would open the door to that heart and mind that's broken that troubled heart to share with them the love and the compassion and the mercy and forgiveness of Jesus. When life tumbles in, what then? Remember the promise of paradise. This morning, do you want to go to heaven? More than anything else, that's the only right answer. If you give some other answer, it's the wrong one, okay? I'll just go ahead and say it. You want to go to heaven more than anything else. Whether life is good or whether life is tough right now or somewhere in between, a mixture of both, do you want to go to heaven? I do because of what Jesus tells me here and what He'll continue to tell me. What we'll keep studying the rest of this chapter will prove that even more and more. This morning, though, Jesus said He's going to prepare a place. Some preacher long ago made the observation, and it's come down to all of us, and it's right. Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. Indeed, it is. And if we expect to be where Jesus is, according to 1 Thessalonians 4, to meet Him, we have to be ready. Preparation must be adequate. Hearing God's Word and believing in the Gospel and the identity of Jesus, considering the evidence, proves He was the Son of God. So He has the right to command us to do whatever He wishes. Further, He defeated death. 
And I just make it a general habit. Here's my rule in life. If a guy dies and comes back to life again, I'm going to do whatever he tells me to do. That's a simple way that I live my life. And so Jesus told me to turn away from sin. Don't live for this world. It's passing away. It's not even worth it. Instead, repent. Confess your faith. Express it not only by what you say, by what you do. And do that by being immersed with me, dying with me, being baptized. There you'll contact my blood. There your sins will be washed away. There you will be raised to walk in newness of life. There will, and by doing that, there you can begin that journey on the road that leads to heaven. We'll help you do that this morning, of course. That's why we're here. As a child of God, do you want to go to heaven more than anything else? It's the only right answer. As life tumbled in, if it does, and it does because it will, what do you do then? You remember that there is something better. It doesn't take away, and please don't leave saying, well, he didn't address what I'm going through right now. Yes, I know what it is right now, and it's tough, and it's no fun. It stinks. It's bad. It's awful. I don't like it, and I never will. But this life can never satisfy me anyways. But Jesus said there's something that is waiting for you that can, and that will, but you must be prepared. And if as a child of God, sin has robbed you of that preparation, separated you again from your God, Life's tumbling in with no hope. Jesus still offers it. And we offer it to you this morning. Repent and pray. Let us help you as we can. Come even now while we stand, while we sing together.